Hi, welcome to the college seminar this week. My name is Jeff Beth Long Patrick in the SE program. Uh, I'm pleased to announce Sue Carosa. Uh, Dr. Carosa has worked in the field of public health for over 20 years, primarily in the area of cancer prevention and control. As a cancer epidemiologist, her research has focused on uh, the investigation of environmental factors for childhood cancers, a special interest in applying geospatial techniques, techniques for measuring environmental exposures. Most recently, Sue has been uh, conducting research into the complex relationship between birth defects and cancers in children. And just to note, today's uh, seminar is co-sponsored by the ESPY program. So, Thanks, to Jeff. Thank you for coming. Does that volume sound okay? Because it sounds hideously loud to me. <laughs> if you're okay with it, then I'm okay with it. So I want to talk today a bit about the area of cancer risk in children with birth defects. So I'm using a Prezi. For those of you that have Prezi issues, this is your trigger warning. I tried to make it not fly around too much. So let's start with birth defects. Birth defects, um, the percent of babies born with a major birth defect is about 3% in the U.S. Um, it's a leading cause of infant, well, uh, a big source of um, pediatric hospitalization and disability. Um, I am not a birth defects epidemiologist, but I've had to learn about them to, to treat them as an exposure for childhood cancers. So I can't handle detailed technical questions about birth defects, but I do have a, a sense of how they're, how they're uh, categorized. So these are the major categories of birth defects from central nervous system to chromosomal. The birth defects world breaks it down more generally into structural versus functional or developmental birth defects. Structural birth defects are like what they sound like. They're a problem with a body part or structure. And examples of that would be a cleft lip, cleft, cleft lip or cleft palate or um, limb abnormalities like club foot. Um, also, heart defects where there's a, a missing or a defective valve, those are considered structural birth defects. Functional or developmental birth defects are, they have to do with how a body system works. So there are uh, four categories of functional birth defects. And the main one is nervous system or uh, brain problems. Down syndrome is a, um, one that fits in that category. So it's something that's going to affect uh, learning or language abilities that may, may involve seizures or movement issues. Um, sensory problems are another type of functional uh, birth defect, that's uh, things that lead to vision impairment or hearing impairment. Metabolic disorders are another category. These are uh, disorders in the body that affect chemical reactions, and so the ability to uh, get rid of um, metabolic waste or harmful chemicals. Um, an example of this is a PKU, uh, this, the inability to process per particular types of chemicals. And the last one is degenerative disorders. And these are uh, often not detected uh, at birth. They're not a, a um, they're not a, what's the word? They're, they're not a big deal. That's a very technical word at birth, but they will um, begin to impede the development of um, a body system getting worse and worse as time goes on. And uh, mus muscular dystrophy is an, an example of that category. So we have Structural, a whole, there are over a thousand different types of birth defects. And in the birth defects world, they, they tend to break them into major and minor. And there are many types of birth defects that have no uh, discernible impact on function uh, or form, but they are you know, something that's different from, from the norm. So there's quite a range of possible types of birth defects. So that's the birth defect side, about the childhood cancer side. Um, I could do a, a whole lecture just on childhood cancers. It's, it's kind of my thing. Uh, but for general purposes, um, it's important to know that they're very different from adult cancers. The type of cancers that kids get tend to have embryonal origins, whereas cancers in adults have epithelial origins. And so the type, they may have some similar names, but the types, the etiology, the histology is very different in children than it is in adults. It's so different that there's a different classification system for childhood cancers, and that's what I've listed up here. It's the International uh, Classification Childhood Cancer System. And there are uh, 
12 to 13 categories, of which about 10 are easily identifiable. And these are the ways that we group and look at uh, cancer outcomes in children. Um, like birth defects, they're uh, a rare outcome, much rarer than birth defects. They're a rare outcome, but have a tremendous uh, burden and impact. Childhood cancer is the leading cause of mortality in children, not just infants, but in children. We tend to define childhood cancers as cancer uh, diagnosed up to age 15. Most of the cancers in children, though, are diagnosed by about age six. There's peaks at age two and four, but the vast majority are, are diagnosed and evident by age six or so. Um, what else do I want to tell you about? They're very, there's very little known about the etiology of almost every childhood cancer. Uh, um, except for retinoblastoma, which is sort of a, an example of an inherited genetic susceptibility, most of the types of childhood cancers are uh, largely unknown, the etiology. And there are certainly no prevention strategies. There's nothing I can say to parents to give them uh, a, an evidence-based approach to trying to prevent cancer in their children. Uh, there's, on the birth defect side, there's more known about prevention strategies, but there's also um, a lot of unknowns in the etiology of birth defects. Okay, so why did I get interested in the relationship between birth defects and childhood cancers? Because in epidemiology, in, our, in my world, they're very separate. The, you don't tend to... Uh, interact. We don't. We have different meetings. We don't really spend time together. Um, but I got interested in this because of the Down syndrome and leukemia story. So Down syndrome, that's trisomy and chromosome 21. Uh, it's, I think, the most common birth defect. It's in like one, something like one in 800 births will have a Down syndrome outcome. These kids have a lot of acquired medical problems. They have beyond uh, the learning um, challenges and the structural problems. They often have many co-occurring. So it's not just the Down syndrome. They commonly have um, congenital heart defects. They have uh, just a range of, of medical problems. But uniquely in this population is their um, incredible risk for developing leukemia. There, if you look at data across Down syndrome kids and non-Down syndrome kids, the, num the percentage of leukemia, of cancers in Down syndrome kids that are leukemia is 95%. In the general population, it's around 35%. So the risk for leukemia in Down syndrome, the studies vary a lot, but anywhere from 10 times to 50 times higher than children without Down syndrome. So they have this very, there's a very profound relationship between Down syndrome status and development of leukemia in children. There, there's another piece to this that makes this an interesting cancer question. So let's look at this a little more closely. The risk for leukemia is very, very high, but as adults, they have incredibly low risk of solid tumors. So this is a study of a Down syndrome cohort. Um, I think it was in Sweden. And you can see there's a, there, oh, you can see what I, usually you can't see what I'm doing. This is the highest risk for the childhood leukemia, ages between two and four. But if you look at this end, after adulthood, they have a fraction of the risk of non-Down syndrome adults for solid tumors. So you have, on both ends of the spectrum, this is a very interesting uh, group of people in terms of their cancer profile and their cancer risk. So that got me interested in what is, what is it about this birth defect that would be driving leukemia risk? And is it possible that this risk is not unique to this birth defect, but is there something about birth defects as a whole that might give us some information about childhood cancers? So that's how I got interested in this relationship. And I uh, decided to do a study to look at all the birth defects and all the childhood cancers because uh, I was just basically curious about the question. So the study, the initial study I did was with a birth cohort from the state of Texas. We had about 3.2 million births. It was 1996 through that one was about 2008, I think, the data. Um, I worked with the state. They did a, a really nice linkage where they linked the birth certificate data to the birth defects data, Texas is um, 
somewhat unique in having a population-based birth defects registry. There are only a handful of states that had that at the time. It's not like cancer surveillance. Birth defects surveillance is a much more complex operation. So in Texas, they had both the well-established cancer registry and a well-established birth defects registry. So working with all of those groups, we have a large cohort that links in the records if there was a reported birth defect and if there was a reported cancer diagnosis before age 15. So that's the basic study design. It was a cohort, and I decided to look at it from both directions. What kinds of cancers do kids with birth defects get, and what kinds of birth defects do kids with cancers have? So in that study, this was the table that represents it having the risk of getting any kind of cancer by birth defect category. If you look down the list, virtually every time of every category or type of birth defect had a statistically significantly increased risk of some cancer. The exception is multiple, musculoskeletal, so not for some reason there's no risk in that category. So the overall risk was right about 2.8, 2.9, right? I always say around three times. So a child with a birth defect was at three times the risk of developing some form of cancer in childhood than a child without a birth defect. And the chromosomal here, 15.5, that largely represents what's happening in the Down syndrome group in that population. So that's reassuring. That's about what we would expect in a population-based study that the highest risk should be in Down syndrome kids. So for those of you who aren't epidemiologists, I remember the first time I presented this to the Society for Epidemiologic Research, everyone in the room got excited because it's three times. And we're so used to seeing 1.10, you know, 1.5, 1.3. And it's like, no, it's, it's a substantial magnitude of risk for the type of work we do at a population level. So let's flip it and look at it in terms of what, for the specific cancers, what is the relationship with birth defects? So looking at it this way, you can see that leukemias, retinoblastoma, soft tissue sarcomas, and germ cell tumors had the highest magnitude of association. So this is the risk of having a birth defect as compared to um, children who did not have a birth defect by specific cancer type. So leukemia, although there's that strong relationship with Down syndrome, the magnitude of the risk is not it's about 1.4, and across many different studies, it tends to be about 1.4, 1.5. So there's a, a consistent relationship, but the magnitude's not that high. But some of the germ cell tumors and the soft tissue sarcomas have five, six, seven times the risk, depending on the study that you're looking at. And again, that about three point increased risk for the relationship between any birth defect and any cancer. So another way to start thinking about, so I, I'm convinced there's a consistent and strong association between birth defect status and a range of childhood cancers. So now you have to think of, well, what, what might be driving that and how can we think of this data to look for um, a better understanding of it? And one way to think of it, the most obvious first step is to think about chromosomal versus non-chromosomal defects. So um, chromosomal defects uh, in the Texas data, and most data, they only account for less than, um, I'm going to make up a number and regret it later. There are three categories of chromosomal uh, defects. There's the Down syndrome, which is the vast majority. Trisomy 13 is Patau syndrome, and trisomy 18 is Edwards syndrome. There are a few others that are sometimes uh, captured in some birth defects registries, but not others. So one way to begin to think of this is, well, let's split it out and look at the non-chromosomal versus the chromosomal. Maybe this is really all driven by the Down syndrome, that strong Down syndrome relationship. So this was a study done about the same time as mine, done in California. And they did the similar thing, linked the birth certificate data for the state to the, their birth defects and then to the cancer registry. And they were looking in... Um, cancer in children under six. So that they had a, a little bit narrower definition of childhood cancer. And if you look at this table, you'll see there's 
that very strong risk among children with chromosomal abnormalities, right? So the first column, uh, up to 100 times in, the, in their particular population for a very um, rare form of leukemia in children, acute myelogen myelogenous, AML. I never had to say it out loud, AML. So there's very strong risk in the chromosomal side. But even with that, if you look over in children without chromosomal anomalies, children who had birth defects but they, they were not in that category, there's still this consistent two to three times higher risk so part of the interpretation is that is it, it is not likely to be entirely genetically driven. There's still some consistent risk in birth defects that don't have a genetic component. This is a, a, another study looking at trying to uh, get at the patterns of where does that risk most, is it most evident? You can see here in the uh, chromosomal abnormalities, this was done in Utah, Arizona, and Iowa. Again, a similar approach of taking um, birth certificate level data and linking it to other registries. And in their data, they found this very high uh, incidence with the highest peak in the earlier years, but that it, in their data up through age 15. So that with chromosomal abnorm uh, abnormalities, there's this continuing risk. But there's still, in the non-chromosomal, the more structural birth defects or functional ones, there's still this consistently raised uh, risk across all the ages. So again, a higher risk in the uh, first year or so, but it's still a consistent raised increased risk. So given, there, there haven't been a lot of studies of this. There are I'd say 20 or less that have looked at this. Uh, my first study came out in uh, 2012, and there's been a few since then, and I, I think we all know each other now, and so when another study comes out, I was just reading one that came out about uh, cesarean sections and ALL, and in there it says, we, this really needs to be replicated, and it was almost like they said, Sue, you need to do this with the Texas data. I was like, yeah, okay, we, we will go and we will look at this, because there just aren't that, because the birth defects are so rare and the cancers are so rare, you have to get a really big cohort together to be able to explore these. So patterns of risk. There's, um, again, another study that looked at this doing a record linkage, and there's that very high risk for infants for uh, under age, about one, under age two. So the highest risk is, is in the youngest kids. But there's still elevated risk across the um, lifespan there. So another question that typically comes up then is, are specific birth defects re, um, related to specific cancers? And my answer at this point is maybe. Um, it's We're looking at a lot of different defects and a lot of different cancers. And when I first started dealing with this data, I, I had envisioned that there would be a, um, a pattern would pop out. And it'd be obvious that you know, central nervous system defects would have central nervous system cancers, and it would just be a, an obvious pattern. And it's actually not quite so obvious. In some studies, there there have been very strong signals. Uh, Johnson, in 2009, they looked at pediatric germ cell tumors associated with uh, cryptorchidism, which is an undescended testicle, and they found a 10 times the risk in children that had uh, a had this condition and their risk of germ cell tumors. So very strong. Uh, Sun et al. found, um, in the, I believe it was, a, I think it was this the California population as well, looked at central nervous system defects and found in their study 18 times the risk of developing specific types of kind of fairly rare central nervous system tumors. So there's that possibility that if study population is large enough, it might be possible to start to pull together specific, a pattern of specific birth defects and specific cancers, but usually it looks more like, like that. So you have an array of birth defects, an array of cancers, and we've tried different statistical approaches to try, kind of tease that out. Uh, I have a grant proposal in right now with some colleagues in Minnesota who are use, want to use computer um, programming language to look at clustering within these. So we're, we keep trying different approaches to be able to 
untangle what those relationships might be. Here's another interesting part that uh, I've seen in my data in multiple analyses and I'm seeing in other people's data is that what I should have mentioned is it's very common for uh, children to have more than one birth defect. In fact, it's, it, it's almost more common to have multiple birth defects than to have just one. And this also gets back to that major or minor thing in birth defects and, it, and many children will have uh, maybe one major heart defect and then several more minor ones around heart function or heart structure. So it's very common to have multiple birth defects. And what we're finding is that when I first put this together, I, uh, not being a birth defects person, ran the first analysis saying, okay, well, let's just do it like a count. So you have one and it's this, and you have two, it's this. And when I presented that to a birth defects group, they were appalled. They were appalled that I had done that. You can't just put them together linearly. It doesn't work that way. So, but yet, no matter how I look at it, when there is more, when there are more birth defects present, there is higher risk. So, um, in our data alone, we found so more than half, a little more than half have more than one birth defects, and it, our range of number of birth defects went all the way up to 13. So we had m multiple infants that had 13 co-occurring birth defects, and and what we found is consistently, no matter how we looked at it, it's about a 30% increase for each additional birth defect. So there there is some information there that. Um, about, it's not dose, because the birth defects people are, again, appalled about that idea, but there's something about the burden of having either specific sets of multiple birth defects or just the load of having. Uh, and this is the fastest I've ever done this talk. I'm on um, allergy medicine, so that <laughs> might have something to do with it, but uh, this is the, the I'm way ahead of time. Uh, so, did I cover everything I wanted? So we're up to the why. I, I, I'm, again, confident that there's a relationship between birth defect status and childhood cancer risk. It's sort of early in um, the investigations of that, and it's, it's challenging to get together large enough data sets to look at uh, more detailed analyses, but we're working, we're working on it. So you can think of it in sort of three ways, right? Either the presence of the birth defect confers some sort of increased risk of the childhood cancer, or it could be flipped. The childhood cancer may actually in increase the risk of the birth defect, and that's not a crazy assumption. There, are, especially for the leukemias, there are um, there's lab data available to show. Uh, very early effects of leukogenic, uh, uh, mostly it's been work in viruses, but very early effects that uh, start some of the childhood leukemias in the womb. So it's not entirely um, out of the range that they, this system might also affect a birth defect. And then there's a possibility that birth defects and childhood cancers are uh, there's an underlying mechanism that influences both of them, and so we're seeing them co-occurring because of a, a related um, you know, exposure or system, and it's not so much that one is causing the other. So if, if those are the um, possible mechanisms, what are, some, uh, what are some of the things that might explain how these are working? And there's, there are a few uh, theories out there. Again, it's kind, kind of early. To, to get into the biological mechanisms, but uh, one fellow has proposed that maybe there is an early event that drives tissue moicism such that the range of tissues um, that have this effect predispose to both a birth defect and to a cancer. And moicism is just in individuals where you have um, cells that actually have different genetic makeup within the same individual. Uh, and it's not that rare. It's actually fairly common in Down syndrome children. But maybe that difference in genetic makeup within the same organs or the same system is driving risks for both of them. There's also the, the why is there a higher risk for some of the bloodborne uh, types of cancers than the solid tumors. And so one thing that might explain that is that 
if there are mutations that are being expressed very early in development when those organ systems are being formed, maybe that is more, um, that may relate to the different pattern between the solid tumors and the uh, leukemia. For those few studies that have looked at specific uh, non-leukemia outcomes, they, they sometimes have 10 and 20 times the risk. So it may be about the timing of development and where there's a, a mutation or, a, or an event early versus later in development. In terms of genetics, clearly the genetics have a role in um, some specific birth defects and some specific childhood cancers, not an overwhelming role. Uh, but in studies that have looked at the SIBs and the parents of children with birth defects and they examined the cancer patterns in those families, there's no clear evidence of an inherited risk. So there's, there's, not a, there's nothing that indicates that there's some sort of super gene or some genetic influence that's just being passed on generationally. There's not a common inherited pattern there. My favorite, and the, the one that I'm most interested in pursuing is the idea that maybe birth defects um, confer a susceptibility to environmental exposures. So there's something about um, either the structure or the function that is related to the birth defect that in the presence of an environmental exposure increases the risk of developing cancer in that child. And this is, uh, kind of takes me into uh, a, a emerging carcinogenesis theory, and that's the tissue organization field theory that looks at cancer as a function of a tissue level drivers rather than a gene level drivers. And that's a whole nother conversation, but the, the relationship between birth defects and childhood cancers may be uh, an example of that theory at, at work where there's um, a disruption at the tissue level that is, affects cell to cell communication, which down the road g gives a rise to a um, cancer influence. Um, I think that's all I wanted to cover today. I usually tell a lot of more stories along the way. I, I think that's what the allergy medicine is doing. It's like, okay, I'm, how did I get to this room and why are these people here? <laughs> um, can I answer any questions or? Uh, oh. <laughs> you're kind, you're kind. And I'm uh, very interested in, in how this strikes you. It's a, it's a new and different way of thinking about childhood cancers and so, I'm always curious to hear people from other disciplines and backgrounds, except for Marit. Anyone else? <laughs> yes? I actually have a bunch of things that occurred to me as you were speaking. Um, the first is, if we're looking at your, your third pattern there, where it's essentially a compounding by indication thing, or there's something else causing both of these, mm -hmm. obviously maternal age is a huge factor for birth defects, particularly the chromosomal ones. Mm -hmm. Is that a risk? factor for childhood cancers or not? It doesn't, no, not, not, yeah, not consistently. Um, the kinds of things that are identified risk factors for, especially leukemias, are things like um, size at birth and um, radiation, which is not a common exposure anymore. Or, or we hope it's not coming back anyway as a common exposure. So th there really aren't, uh, around demographics, there really are not. There For a while there was, uh, evidence that higher socioeconomic status was possibly a, a risk factor, but it hasn't really borne out under closer observation. There is a profoundly different risk for childhood leukemia between um, white, uh, Hispanic, and African American populations, with Hispanic having the highest childhood cancer. So, yeah, it's one of the unusual patterns in. His, cancer in Hispanics is usually lower than most of the other population groups, but for childhood leukemia, the peak is actually higher in Hispanic children. It's similar to the peak in um, white children. In African American children, there is not, there's almost not a peak. That's another part of what got me interested in this, is why would African American children at a population level be protected from what is a very dramatic peak in risk for both um, white and Hispanic children. But that's again another 
another talk. So I don't, there, there are not well-established factors other than race, ethnicity. So no. then if we're looking, if we're going with the assumption that the childhood cancer is starting in utero somehow, mm -hmm. whether it's a far or family tree, mm -hmm. and we're not necessarily seeing the birth defect and the cancer at that same site, is it rather the uh, gestational age at which that particular birth defect arises because, you know, the embryology people mm -hmm. know very well. Mm -hmm. So is it that leukemia starts, I mean, that's a bad example because obviously the chromosomal that's, stuff is older, but, mm -hmm. you know, do the, the, the central nervous system things start, start with at the it. same time or whatever that environmental exposure? Yeah, and, and uh, in Epi, the way we'd like to look at that is windows of exposure, and we can't. You can't do that I'd with, have to. With blastocysts. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but even trying in pregnancy data to uh, tie exposures to at least the trimesters or to, you know, and we're trying to do that with some of our um, fracking data. We're we're looking at uh, it's a whole other study, but we're looking at uh, fracking exposures and both birth defects and childhood cancer and, and all together. Um, it's so hard, again, to get a large enough cohort, get detailed information about environmental exposures in the week of pregnancy. So I'm kind of waiting for the animal people, to, to, the ones who torture zebrafish and do that sort of thing. If they can give me a better idea of how timing, the teratology part of it, then we might could at the population level start to hone in on is there at least a timing, is there a window that is more shows a stronger relationship? Um, but I, I, that's a, a great question, and maybe we'll work on a study together on it. The only yeah. other timing thing is with your Down syndrome, there's some evidence that those abnormal oocytes occur when the mother of your child who now has happen when she's in utero. So you might oh, have great. To go way back for your okay. Yeah, that'll make it simpler. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> did, if we can do it that way. And Thanks. They're, they're, well, Thanks. they're frozen in, in mid-meiosis, so there's... Oh. Okay, there that's a very good point. You're born yeah. with all your eggs ready to go. You yeah, know? yeah. Me personally and everyone else. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good to know. Yeah. Anything? Yeah. Yes. I <laughs> Off of what Dr. Goldberg said, um, with regards to that window susceptibility, one of the things, and thank you for your, your talk, by the way, it was fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, what triggered for me is when you were showing the, the relative risk and um, the musculoskeletal uh, let's see, mm -hmm. the defects in cancer, it seemed almost protective. And yeah. When you did the sarcoma and birth defects, that also seemed. Protected. Oh, I can't go so back in, in this mind, one. I was thinking, well, when is that window? When yeah. Is, when is the, the musculoskeletal system developing? And, of course, that window is mm -hmm. different than mm -hmm. all of these others. So I'm wondering if that is possibly, I'm sure you've thought about it, but I'd like to know if you talked about it. Yeah, it, it's a, something we'd like to explore, but it's back to the same issue of at a population level, getting the timing down that precisely is really difficult to do with sort of public health surveillance level data. But I, I am absolutely convinced timing is key to whatever it is that's driving this. The, in utero. In utero, yeah, I'm sorry, in utero. The, the other part of childhood cancers is there's um, very little indication that exposures in early childhood have much influence on risk. It seems to be most tied to in utero events. And that may just be that we're measuring things wrong or that that data is just really hard to get a clear signal from. But the studies that have looked at like diet and environmental exposures up to age one and two have not shown that there's a strong connection between that timing and risk. So for those reasons, we focus on the in utero exposures. But yeah, if I could do timing, that would be, that'd be great. Uh, e either of the back row. <laughs> well, I'm just wondering with uh, sort of fairly recent data on kind of body burden for contamination, mm -hmm. um, how much has the literature science advanced in terms of multiple exposures interacting when during the mm -hmm. gestational period? I The risk assessment um, approaches, I think, are far behind the science now. Um, there's 
there has they haven't modified the approaches to look at specificity of timing during pregnancy or um, the body burden as it. I mean, they've barely gotten to where they look at child levels that are you know. So not to be denigrating, it's just it takes time for those things to happen. And your your question reminds me of a, at another, another seminar when I presented this. One of the questions was, well, are you now comfortable telling uh, women who have children with uh, birth defects that, oh, and on top of this, they're, they're likely to get cancer? It's like, no, <laughs> no. What I would hope is we would say, prevention of birth defects may also have an, uh, a bonus effect of decreasing incidence of childhood cancers. So that's more where we are at the public health level. Since we haven't identified an environmental toxin that's related to most of these birth defects, then if that's the chain, I, you know, we really can't get all the way to, we need to monitor this because two events down the road might be affected. I don't think the science is there yet. But I do hope I'm not this work doesn't, because I have had a bit of pushback from the birth defects community about, well, what is the message and how do you frame it? Uh, so I, I'm a cancer epidemiologist, so I'm looking to prevent cancer, but wouldn't it be make sense and follow then that this should be evidence towards preventing birth defects? You know, I don't know if that answered you. I probably don't have an answer to your question. That's probably what that's all about. Yeah. Marie? Well, I was just curious as to what your next steps mm -hmm. are, what you're, if you're pursuing this environmental exposure piece. I, yeah, I am through starting with the fracking. Uh, the reason I was interested, in, and Perry Heisted's working with me on uh, the fracking, we're looking at fracking from uh, the same Texas data using well data that we have purchased from Texas. And he has interest in, um, pollution levels and birth outcomes. So the agreement was, okay, we can use it for that, but eventually we're gonna to get to the birth defects and the childhood cancers. The first pass that we're doing was looking at benzene exposures because that's a, an established risk factor for adult leukemias, a less well-established one for childhood leukemia. So I, I have a doctoral student who's just, in fact, we we're just putting our manuscript in for <laughs> looking at that, looking at benzene from all these different environmental exposures and uh, childhood leukemias, and, it, and we find a consistent pattern there. But what I threw in that is different is controlling for birth defects. And it looks like children with birth defects in this population were more, much more susceptible than the general population. So that's part of what I'm trying to do is get that idea into the community that the relationship of um, childhood cancers may be modified by birth defect status because none of the studies account for that. So I, Martin and I are going to go back and look at a study that just came out saying C-section is a, a problem for childhood leukemias. And we're like, did you look at birth defects? Because one of the reasons they may be having these C-sections is because they have, you know, they have challenging pregnancies for one reason or another. So that's part of, so there's a couple of different ways I'm pursuing this with other researchers and definitely the environmental, but I don't have, it's not like there's well-established environmental risk factors for childhood cancer, so I can go and look at that. So I'm thinking more of, well, let's look at what's established for birth defects and see if that gets us closer to childhood cancers. Yes. Hi, I missed the very beginning, so I apologize. Yeah, you, you didn't miss anything. Um, <laughs> Do birth defects and childhood cancers cluster in the same area? Do the geography, the family? Yeah, we're we're doing that too. Um, that sort of, but I, again, it's not when you if you do any birth defect in any cancer, it gets very um, the numbers get really small unless you do it that way. So it's not very informative. But yes, I'm working with some students who are looking at clustering, and I would say. Our initial thing in Texas is they, they do appear to cluster spatially, but it's not a clear, it's not a clear picture. Birth defects on their own cluster spatially? Yes. Okay. Yeah. But so, for some of them, they're, they know why. Because for some of them, there are very obvious environmental events that occur, and, and that's why. Yeah. And childhood cancer is kind of, the leukemia is kind of cluster, kind of. If you kind of squint and, you know. <laughs> yes. Um, just to 
pop all the way back there, but, but is there mm -hmm. a, a signal between the rural and urban environment um, for these clusters? Okay. So what we've looked at sort of separately, the, um, the factor in the geographically is more industrial activity than urban rural. And for instance, in the fracking data in Texas, it's not uncommon to have um, a fracking well in your backyard. So the urban rural thing doesn't really capture what's happening in that industry. And it turns out, depending on the what part of the country you're in, the urban rural part doesn't actually capture the industrial exposures part. So although I, I've done work on urban rural continuum and, and quickly realized this isn't about Population density. This is about what's in those areas. The yeah, are yeah. Because I did work on pesticides and looking at agricultural exposures, and again, it was like it doesn't really matter if they're urban rural because you can have a cotton farm in your backyard in Texas and be just outside of Austin, which is where I lived. And I didn't realize there was a cotton farm there till I lost a dog toy over the fence, and I went and looked over the fence and I was like, oh my god. There's a giant cotton. That's why the airplanes are coming over and spraying pesticides, because there's a cotton farm. So it, depending on the community, you, you can have close proximity of, of different environmental exposures. Well, thank you all for your questions. Thank you for coming. I'm going to go home and take a nap now. <laughs>